What's up tweenerheads, welcome back to another tweenerhead tennis video today here on our channel. If you are new to the channel, hey, how's it going? My name's Phil, and this is where we get to talk about tennis in a more casual way for you guys to understand what's going on on and off the court, and just to have some fun with the sport of tennis itself. Now today we have a very special interview with Parenting Aces founder, Lisa Stone. Parenting Aces is basically a guide for Tennis Parents 101, where she talks about her experience, her kids, what she went through as a tennis mom with her kids, and trying to help the new generation of moms that are helping their kids go through juniors, college level, getting recruited, what it takes to go pro, what steps they need to take going forward. So it was really interesting to see that perspective because for me, I'm not a parent yet, but for my dad and my mom, listening to what Lisa talked about, it really resonated with me and how parents make sacrifices for their kids to get better at the sport. and they know what to do and they may know what's best for you but lisa really gave a good perspective on that and i just wanted to share that experience with you guys it's a bit lengthy but it's definitely well worth it when it comes to listening to that insight and understanding what goes on in the recruitment process what goes on in juniors things within that nature so i hope you guys do enjoy this video make sure you are subscribed to tween your head tennis we have a lot of new videos coming out and we do a bunch of live streams now so that way you guys can know what's going on in tennis as well so make sure you're subscribed with notifications turned on so that way you don't miss any new content that we're posting here on the channel check us out on facebook twitter instagram all those social media links are down in the description below and i hope to see you again soon enjoy the video guys thank you so much lisa why don't you tell us about yourself and how parenting aces came about sure um well first of all thanks for having me on and it's nice to see your face it's been a while um, <laughs> yeah um so parenting aces is a love project a passion project i have been involved in tennis as long as i can remember i grew up in a tennis family my dad grew up playing tennis played at tulane was on the national championship team there and uh at He'll be 83 this week at 83 is still playing singles and Love it. Um, Love it. is amazing. My, both my brothers played growing up. I played growing up. Uh, one of my brothers is still very, very involved in the tennis world in Shreveport, Louisiana, where we grew up. And, mm. um, you know, and I grew up playing in Louisiana, grew up playing in the Southern section, uh, played high school tennis and then stepped away from the game for quite a while. And, got back into it when my youngest child, my son started playing and getting serious about it. Mm -hmm. And um, so I play myself all the time and um, love it. And Parenting Aces was really born out of necessity. My okay. son was starting to really progress in the juniors and um, had a goal of playing college tennis and wanted you know, wanted some guidance, asked his coaches, you know, what tournament should I be playing? What do I need to be doing? Uh, I was asking those questions. We were turning to USTA, not getting answers that we could use. We were turning to other parents, getting conflicting information. And so I finally kind of happened upon a Facebook group of former junior champion players who okay. were an incredible source of information for me. Okay. And I don't know why they let me in the group, but thank God they did. <laughs> and I started posting my questions on this group mm -hmm. and getting some incredible information and guidance about coaching, about tournaments, about rankings, about recruiting, everything. And one of the members of the group said, you know, Lisa, if you have all these questions about junior tennis and junior tennis development, don't you think there are other parents out there who are in your same position? Why don't you put all this information you're getting on a website? Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, hmm, okay, I could do that. So exactly. I, yeah, started a website, started documenting my journey with my son and, um, you know, posting articles about our experiences at tournaments, um, different things that he was going through, different things that I was going through as a parent. Um, and then about six or eight months into the project, I was asked to do a radio show at the time. It was before podcasts were a thing. And 
was asked to join this tennis network, uh, like a radio network of shows. Okay. And so they asked me to host a weekly show for tennis parents. And that was the start of the Parenting Aces podcast, which has now become its own freestanding entity and recently became part of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network, which is pretty cool. And Congratulations. I know that yeah. was, that was exciting. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so still going strong. My son is now 24 years old, a grown man living on his own, working in the real world and doing all those things. And so okay. my role with Parenting Aces has really um, kind of, you know, had to pivot several times over the course of his journey and okay. my journey. And um, so now I'm not on the ground like I used to be, you know, week in and week out at tournaments and day by day at practices and all of that. But I rely on other parents to feed information to me. I have okay. great relationships with USTA, with UTR, with the ITA, with the ITF. And, um, you know, I'm able to, I hope, I, you know, provide valuable content still to the parents out there. It seems like this is, this should have been made. And I'm glad you've made something like this as kind of a go-to source for parents because for me when I was growing up I was the first one to play tennis in my family competitively at least to mm -hmm. go play ITF juniors to go play USTA juniors and you would always hear things from other parents of some form of guide of okay this is the path that you should do if they're looking to do this if they're mm -hmm. looking to go pro this is where you should go so how did you kind of gather your all of your information to put onto your I'm, website is that just well, with like i said i mean part of it's you know experience and sharing my story with my son and you know the things that I, i've always been very upfront when i've messed things up and said you know don't do this i did this and this is what happened and this is not a good path to go down mm -hmm. um so there's been a lot of trial and error that I've documented over the 10 years I've been doing this. But okay. also, like I said, I've developed relationships. So um, there are a lot of junior coaches that I talk to on a regular basis. There are a lot of college coaches I talk to on a regular basis who, you know, when they get information, they send it my way. Um, you know, I get information from, again, the governing bodies. I'm on, you know, the media lists for the various um, federations around the world. So I get updates on what's happening. And I try to just share that, whether it's in an article on parentingaces.com, whether it's on the Parenting Aces podcast or one of our social channels. Of course. And I think to kind of get into more on the parenting side, hence Parenting mm -hmm. Aces, how would, what was the best piece of advice you got for a mom that, would, that had a son being in the top percent of juniors in their region? What was the best piece of advice someone gave you as a mom going through this? Um, that it never gets easier and understanding that as a parent, it, it never gets easier watching your kid play. And that piece of advice actually came from Melanie Udan's mom. And I don't know. Oh, uh, you know yeah, of course. We'll remember El Melanie, but, um, mm -hmm. Melanie and my son trained at the same academy when oh, wow. he was first starting out and, mm -hmm. um, and they lived in the same area of Atlanta that we lived in. And so our paths crossed quite a bit, but we were at a junior tournament her melanie's younger sister was playing and my son was playing and the mom and i were in the ladies room and chatting you know as we're washing our hands and i was like you know please tell me this gets easier and she's like no and in fact it gets a lot harder because more is on the line as they get further along in their career so you just need to know that and figure out how to manage it and that's not to say that that was you know the answer and and you know that she said if you do a b and c you'll be fine no she didn't say that to me but it was enlightening and helpful for me to kind of let go of that expectation that you know i'm going to get better as a parent and one day you know i'm going to be able to sit there and not be phased by what's going on on the court no that's never going to happen but i did get better in learning how to manage my emotions and my body language and the car ride home and yes. all of those things 
No, it, it takes trial and error, uh, especially from a parent with young kids, yeah. and impressionable kids, I should say. And for me, at least from a parent's perspective, there were those that were good to hang around with when you were at a tournament. And there were those that were maybe a little bit more intense or one of those that just rubbed you the wrong way. It's You can never yeah. really find the right solution or find the right formula until you've done it for a while. Well, and I think too, one of the challenges is every kid's so different, right? So yeah. even if you are the parent of multiple tennis players, right, you're, the way you handle one child's tennis journey may be completely different from the way you handle the next child's tennis Absolutely. journey. And the same like with college recruiting, you know, people think, oh, I've been through this once, you know, now I know how to do this. Well, no, mm -hmm. every kid's journey is very different. And so I think being flexible, being malleable, being open to experimenting mm -hmm. with different ways of doing things is a helpful way to be. So. Of course, you have to be at least supportive as much as you can. And I actually wanted to post this question to you because I posted it on Twitter and I tagged you in it before yeah. I began to do this. Yeah. And the, would you sit on the court with your son while he practiced or would you wait in the waiting area or behind the glass? Because I feel like for me, it makes me nervous when parents sit on court mm -hmm. it, or it's at least intimidating. I'm going to be be perfectly honest because if my clients are listening to this right now I mean I don't know what to do or what to say necessarily so mm -hmm. from your background and your perspective do you think that's a good idea for parents to be that close with the process of their uh, kids training it, it really depends. And it's funny because I've been following the thread on Twitter um, yeah. and reading the result, you know, the responses that are coming in. And, you know, one of the things that I have preached from the get go is, and a lot of coaches have followed parenting aces over the years uh -huh. and where I feel there tends to, to be the potential for problems is when there's a lack of communication. So mm -hmm. if, if I'm the parent and I'm paying you as a coach to work with my child and I'm paying you significant money, you know, my child's on a pretty, you know, high level path and, you know, we're, we're on the court, you know, my kids there five days a week, six days a week playing tournaments, mm -hmm. multiple weekends a month. This is a big investment for me. If you as a coach aren't keeping me in the loop about what you're working on with my child how my child's progressing both in their tennis skill you know strokes and movement and tactics and strategies and all of that but also their mental development their maturity on the court their ability to handle conflict and and disappointment and handle cheating and handle all of the things that come up in junior tennis if you're not communicating with me on a regular basis and i'm not saying it needs to be every day or even every week but certainly at least once a month, I need some sort of update of what's yeah. going on. Um, then I feel more inclined to be present because being present is the only way I'm going to find out what's happening. Yeah. If you don't want me sitting there, then do a better job letting me know what's going on when my kid is with you. Mm -hmm. And you know, have some sort of expectation of what I'm going to be able to find out as a parent, because even, and I saw, you know, people commented that, well, you don't go sit in your child's school class every day, yeah, yeah, you know, that's... why, why do you, you know, but, but that's why there are parent teacher conferences yeah. so that, you know, and that's why there are report cards and that's why parents have to sign tests so that parents are in the loop and know what's happening on a regular basis with their child. Same thing, in my opinion, should hold true with tennis and mm -hmm. especially high level tennis. I mean, if this is a kid that just wants to go out and learn the game for social reasons and may play a tournament a couple times a year and whatever, that's a very different situation to mm -hmm. me. But for the kid that is on that elite developmental pathway, I think it's crucial that coaches do a better job communicating. Uh -huh. It's, it's hard to, like you said, it's a different situation for everyone. And through that thread, mm -hmm. we saw, we got many responses. We got one that yes. was like, no way. Some were yes, but it depends on the parent. Right. I mean, 
it depends on what do you think is going to help your kids progress. Is it better for you to just constantly sit there and they'll look over to you after you make a mistake? Or do you want to actually try to improve and kind of get that sense of, okay, you're going to be on the court. It's just you and me. How do we work on what we need to work on now versus well, what and we part of this too, Philip. Go ahead. Right. Part of this, Philip, is is having that level of trust between the coach and the parent, right? Mm. So if I'm hiring you to coach my child, yeah. I need to be able to trust that you have my child's best interest at the forefront every time my child is out there, right? Yeah. That you're looking out for him or her, that you're not only making sure that the stroke development is there, the movement's there, the fitness is there, but also that they're behaving properly, that they're not you know, that you're not allowing them to throw the racket. You're not allowing them to cheat. You're not allowing them to use foul language on the court, things mm. that are going to get them in trouble once they're in a tournament situation, right? This is, these are all things that need to be practiced on the practice court in the presence of a coach. So the child learns the expected behaviors. And if I don't feel like that level of trust is there, then I need as the parent to say, maybe this isn't the right coach for my child. Maybe this isn't the right coach for our family because I need A, B, and C from a coach. Uh -huh. And this coach has been very clear that he or she's not willing to provide that. Well, let me And that's okay. Yeah. That's okay. Uh -huh. I'm, not every coach is right for every family and not every family is right for every coach. So of course. again, this is what makes tennis so complicated, right? <laughs> that you can't just say you do it this way and you will find success. And I think to, there's like two things in that, that I want to unpack. One is I agree with you. It depends on the coach and kid relationship because someone I know the player didn't like the coach for a really long time, mm -hmm. but they stuck with him and she eventually got better and she got used to it and she became, she's becoming a better player. Mm -hmm. The other hand is the trust. And that kind of poses the question of the mental aspect in my mind to a kid's game, because how can you trust the parent that they're doing enough for the kid to be Mentally stable is not the word. It's sound. Strong. Strong. Mental, mm -hmm. uh, mentally strong when they're yeah. on the court. Do you – Yeah. Because that, because that becomes an awkward conversation with a parent of, like, your kid's nuts sure. on the court. Your kid – like, your child doesn't know what it's – like, doesn't know how to handle that kind of pressure or knows how to let it go. And, it, and some people may say that's the parent's fault, and you don't know if that's necessarily true. But how would you go about telling the, a parent that they need more help on the mental side? Because you can't just brush well, it off and say, it's all, no. it's, it's more mental. It's like, yeah, he'll, he'll probably grow out of it. No, that's, that's an issue you need to solve now. Well, yes and no. I mean, there is a maturity piece of that, right? Mm -hmm. And kids mature at different rates and, of and course. all of that. But... That said, as a coach, if you notice a kid is crying when they lose a point, for example, or throwing their racket for every missed ball or cussing or cheating to win a point, I think it's your responsibility to, to have a meeting with the parent, whether it's by phone or in person or whatever, and say, hey, you know, I'm noticing these behaviors on the court. Is there something going on at home or at school or socially that may be causing your child to act in this manner? Or is this something that you're seeing in other aspects of his or her life? And you know, it maybe we need to bring in another member of the team to help work on these things. And, or maybe, you know, let me suggest that you read this book or you listen to this podcast or you, you know, talk to this parent who's been through a similar situation with their child. But, you know, my job as the coach is to help your child reach his or her potential. And there's something getting in the way of that right now and so we need to fix it well do you think that's a bit too personal to play devil's advocate here do you think that could be considered too personal if because then 
if you get too personal with that family, then it becomes on the coach's job to not like, not the coach's job, but they could tell your boss and they can tell, they say, Oh, this is too personal. You have to talk to them because then it could backfire if that well, happens. Right. And, and I get that. Um, mm -hmm. you know, when I speak to coaches and I've, I've spoken at coaches conferences, you know, I remind coaches that it's within your power to fire me as, as the parent back yourself out of it. Um, I, you know, it is a touchy situation and I get in a club environment, there are politics to deal with. Of course. But if your commitment is if the best he or she can be, then you have to work together on this. And as a parent, I would, I would welcome you coming to me and saying, Hey, I'm seeing some behaviors that I, I don't think you'd be okay with if you saw them, you know, what's going on. Is this something we need to, to work on together? Yeah. And, and it's a, a triangle, right? I mean, we all talk about this a lot, you know, the parent player coach triangle and the parent is when the player's younger, the, the parent is playing a bigger role, right? Because it's a young child and, the parent is in charge. The parent's yeah. writing the checks. The parent's driving the kid, yada, yada, yada. Because they're as in charge the of the child becomes episode. right. But as the child enters teenage years, then some of that has to shift onto the kid. The kid has to start to take responsibility for some of these things. And that's, I, and I wrote about that a lot when my son was kind of reaching that place, you know, knowing when it was time for me to back away and give it to him and let him own those things and deal with them and mm -hmm. suffer the consequences if he didn't deal with them and, and all of that. So it, it's just like anything else, you know, it's a fine line, but, but getting back to your original question of parents should be on the court. I mean, if, if, if I'm in a situation where all I can afford is for my child to have one session a week with a coach and the rest of the week, it's going to be me on the court with my kid, then yes, I think it's appropriate for the parent not to necessarily be on the court, but to be near enough to the court to hear and see what the coach is teaching mm -hmm. so that the parent can reinforce that on the other days of the week. But, you know, if, if my kid's with a coach daily, yeah. then is there a reason for me to be sitting there every day? Probably not. Exactly. It, it just, and I think you're right in that sense, because at what age did you know that your son was starting to speak up for himself and start influencing what was being coached rather than yourself? Well, I never influenced it. I mean, I, well, I influenced it in terms of choosing the coach, Yeah. you know, and, but my son participated in that process too. Okay. Um, but you know, I, I tried, I'm sure I failed miserably in a lot of areas, but, but my intent was that my son would take his tennis as far as he wanted to take it. Okay. And as far as he was willing to put in the work, I mean, I knew I couldn't get out there and become a better tennis player for him. Yes, of you course. Know, he had to do it. That's so, well, but it's not. There are a lot of really? parents who, well, sure, there are parents who push their kids beyond what the kid is interested in doing, and then it just causes this huge conflict, potentially, right, where mm. the kid's like, I hate this, you know, mm. I don't want to be here, but I can't tell my parents because they'll yell at me, um, and so I guess that's one of the underlying purposes of Parenting Aces, too, is to really, again, getting back to that communication word, yeah. you know, the communication between the parent and the player has to remain very open through all of this too. Mm -hmm. And the parents have to learn to recognize signs of burnout, signs of frustration, signs of, I hate this and don't want to do it anymore. And it's time exactly. to take a break. Yes. Um, and the kids have to learn how to speak up and Express say, themselves. I'm really not happy. Right. And not, feign a stomach ache or feign a headache because they don't want to go to practice, but just say, you know what, I need a break from this. Okay. So it's part of the growing process, right? It's mm -hmm. part of 
our kids moving from early childhood into adolescence into young adulthood into adulthood mm -hmm. is learning how to recognize feelings and then put words to them. Yeah. And you touched on it a little bit before about the parent, parent, student, parent, child relationship with playing. And I actually wanted to go on to the next subject of that, which is a good transition because it's when a parent, is their coach mm -hmm. and how well it can work. And we've seen it work well to an extent. We saw originally when Andre Agassi, Serena, the Williams sisters, now Sophia Kennan, there have been a lot Coco of Goff. Coco Goff. Sorry, excuse me. Yeah. But there, there's and Andy Murray with his mom, yeah. essentially it's it. There are success stories, but then yeah. there's the other side where some have really had the brunt of it where their parents were too controlling too outlandish in the public eye there were a lot of headlines in that sense so yeah when, abusive abusive I mean, yeah we've seen it yeah how would you do you think that kind of relationship is last longer than people think or are those special cases when they make it to the pros with their parents? I mean, I think it's rare to have a successful parent child slash parent coach relationship. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are definitely people who have done it successfully. Um, but I also think there are far more cases where either the kid gives up tennis because they're so miserable or they keep playing tennis, but the relationship with the parent is a disaster. Mm -hmm. And I will say, um, I interviewed my son on, on my podcast last right. summer, and I okay. knew what he was going to say ahead of time. But a lot of people listening to that were troubled by some of the things he said. But, In what way? Well, just he was very honest about his relationship to the sport and mm -hmm. things that he went through growing up. Okay. But, but the one thing he did say multiple times over the course of the podcast was how close he and I remained through all of it, even though we would have momentary headbutting, you know, but at the end of the day, he valued and I certainly valued the amount of time we got to spend together and we are super close now. Um, yeah. you know, and for me, that was always was at the top, right. Okay. And the tennis was well below that. Um, I think if you are the coach of your own child, it's much more difficult to maintain that, that balance between the tennis and the parent child relationship mm -hmm. and to switch that hat on and off. And I think it takes a lot of work on the part of the parent to know when to have the coach hat on and when to have the parent hat on. And especially if there are other children in the family who aren't tennis players, it becomes that much more difficult. It becomes a dilemma. So, I mean, it's tough. And, you know, my son would tell me multiple times when he was growing up, okay, mom, enough tennis talk. We're done. Like, you know, I don't want to talk about this anymore. Let's talk about something else. Or he would just clam up. And, you know, I would, after several minutes of continuing to run my mouth, mm -hmm. realize, you know, no, 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 I need to stop. We need to talk about something very different. How'd that math test go today? <laughs> you know? He probably didn't want to talk about that either, to be honest. It, no, you. but you know, it was, just it was not topic. tennis. It was of just course. not tennis. So. so if you were to change something that you did with your son growing, like doing and being a part of his tennis journey mm -hmm. in life that kind of led to parenting aces, what's one thing that you wish you could have done better or shouldn't have done that parents, that parents may or may not know about? There's so many. <laughs> I screwed up majorly. Um, I, I, th I mean, I one think of this is like an improving point for parents because this is sure. it. They need a guideline in a sense to figure out what their kids should do. And they know right. what they want. 
but how do they achieve that? Right. I, I wish I had understood how unimportant, truly unimportant rankings and ratings are um, okay. prior to really the 16s. Once they hit the 16s, you have to, you have to understand how all that works and it's becomes important for college recruiting and all of that. Prior to that, it's so unimportant. And I, I get the argument that, well, if you're not ranked at a certain level, you don't get the opportunities to play in these higher level tournaments and yada, yada. So what? <laughs> I yeah, mean, exactly. just so what? Um, so I wish I had, not been so obsessed with that and as a result made my son obsessed with all of that I also wish I hadn't let him play as many tournaments as I did um because I think it leads to injury and burnout and it's again it's unnecessary I think you know playing two tournaments a month maximum is sufficient playing every single weekend or three out of four weekends gets to be too much And then the last thing I wish, I really wish I had understood, and I learned this once he got to college, was if your child takes a break from tennis for a week, a month, three months, six months, it's not the end of the world. And they can come back to the sport. And oftentimes they come back stronger and better and more committed and more energized than if they didn't take that break. And... Nobody told me that, um, and I never saw anybody take a break like that. Like none of the people in our junior tennis world were taking breaks, so I didn't have that behavior modeled for me. But just you know, as circumstances happened, my son's freshman year of college um, spring semester was a disaster, and he wound up taking three months off from tennis. Wow. And um, decided to come back to it on his own. And when he made that decision to come back, it was with gusto and commitment because he had very specific things he wanted to accomplish by coming back to tennis. Not necessarily tennis related. Um, some were tennis related, but a lot of it was, had to do with opportunities to be at certain a certain college in a certain area of the country and things of course. like that. So I agree. I think that's, yeah. I think that's a good insight because parents need to know when to stop pushing their child to the limit. And in today's day and age, there are different approaches to how you can coach your kid. But mm-hmm. when it comes to making sure your child's safe in a safe place, mentally and physically, mm-hmm. you're not going to be able to push them anymore. If you can't figure out where that, breaking point is and if you don't find that soon your your child's probably going to stop playing tennis right to be be perfectly honest there's no way around that yeah yeah and i mean my son's a case in point right he hasn't picked up a racket since the end of his sophomore year of college and um you know he's he teases me now that you know maybe next time we're together we'll go out and hit he actually came and watched me play um at least he still watched months ago right but that was the first time no that was the first time and he came out and watched me play and he enjoyed being out there and watching and you know he said maybe i'll hit with you next time i come down so you know i don't push it because Uh it's whatever it's up to him he's a grown man now he do what he wants but but i i will say i will be thrilled you know when he says to me hey mom let's go hit some tennis balls that will make me very happy yeah so so i i think for you wrapping up here i think i have two more questions here okay one i actually want to ask you about this do you think that junior players should play itf tournaments or usta tournaments oh well depends on the part of the country you're in right now because there's well, a not, lot of the country that's not having <laughs> USTA tournaments, but, but you, you're, you're talking when we're not in a pandemic. When we're not in a pandemic, because for me, when I was growing up, I lived in South America. So I was able to play ITF junior events in yeah. South America because there were countries close. There were lots of them. There were yeah. lots of them. Yeah. In the U S yeah, there's, there are now higher ranked tournaments for USTA level, but you also have ITF junior events going 
out in California, Texas, Florida, all these places. Yeah. Do you not very ever, many though? Not not very, very many. many. But right. if they were to travel, yeah. Which one do you think would make one's child get better? I mean, that's kind of a loaded question. So I, <laughs> it is, but it, you it, know, for me, this is the question I always had as a kid. Right. I think if money's no issue and you can afford the travel, then it's really cool to travel around the world and play tennis tournaments and be in different cultures and meet kids from different parts of the world and, you know, learn that a teenager's a teenager and we're all more alike than we're different. And all of these life lessons that you get from just being a traveler, right? But not every family's in a position to afford to travel like that. And so from a developmental standpoint, I think you can stay home and Mm -hmm. develop to a very high level Mm -hmm. if you open yourself up to opportunities beyond just the junior events that are in your area. So for example, playing men's open or women's open events, Mm -hmm. um, once you're old enough to join adult leagues, playing in those events and learning these different styles of play and learning how to manage as an opponent to these different styles of play. Um, you know, getting out and hitting with college players. Uh, if you're, you know, 14 years old, Mm -hmm. being on a court with a college player is invaluable. So I think there are plenty of opportunities at home. Um, but again, it, you know, I'm, I love to travel. I, you know, I have kids who enjoy traveling. I think traveling opens up things to you, opportunities to you, ideas, um, ways of looking at the world that you don't get when you stay home in your own little bubble. So as a citizen of the world, yes, I think it's awesome to be able to go to ITF events all over the place and compete. I also think because college tennis, if, if college tennis is the goal for the junior player, college tennis is so international now yeah. that having exposure to international players from age 14, as opposed to waiting till you're 18 in college, puts you at an advantage because you're seeing, you know, those different styles of play. And you get to play against players that have a different game plan, have a different idea of how to play the game. And it's, I Even just start- seeing how they warm up, how they prepare for matches, yeah. what they do after their match, what they're doing between matches. I mean, here in the States, we, you know, everybody tends to do things pretty similarly. And then, I mean, I, my son went and trained in, in Mallorca for a month and, you know, he was in culture, culture shock, not just being in Spain, but culture shock on the tennis court, the way practices were managed, the way time on and off the court was managed was completely different than anything he had ever experienced. So I think that was super valuable for him. I agree. And I always want, when I played overseas, it would be much different because then I would come back to the States and it would be two hours of straight tennis with, there's like a certain routine that you go through every day. And I wasn't, I was never used to that. So it always made me question, am I in the right place where I train? So Mm -hmm. I think that was the biggest thing. And the last question I have for you is what's the best way I bet you get this a lot. What's the best way for kids to get recruited for college to start making relationships huh no i i thought you were telling me something else i'm sorry no 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 (laughs) no to in order the best way to get recruited is to start forming relationships with college coaches and college players as early as you can okay so when you're at a tournament and there's a college coach there going up and introducing yourself and saying, you know, Hey, I'm so-and-so I'm playing at two o'clock today. You know, if you have a chance to watch, I'd love to get your input on what you're seeing on the court, you know, Mm -hmm. um, going to camps at on college campuses and, and getting to know the coaching staff that way and getting to know the existing players, connecting with the existing players on social media, because a lot of college coaches rely on their existing team members to give them feedback on recruits. And so if you already have relationships with members on that team who know you, who see you on social media, um, who kind of have a feel for who you are, yeah. they can give that feedback 
to the coach and help you. But it, college recruiting is all about relationships. And I will say that the parents need to take a giant step back from the recruiting process. Really? Let the player own it. It wow. is not the parent's job to do recruiting for their kid. Um, okay. The kids need to absolutely own that process. The parents need to say, this is what we can afford budget wise. This is the geographic you know, distance. We're comfortable with you looking. Um, these are some factors that we'd like you to consider academically. And then they need to step back and let the kid own it. Okay. Co college coaches hate hearing from the parents. They don't, they don't want to hear from you. They want to hear from the kid. I love that. I love that. It's true. It's very true. And I think not a lot, some parents don't understand that if they want to do it, they'll do it. They, right. they don't need and your don't, help. You know, I have a lot of friends who run recruiting businesses. And so I, I'm always hesitant to say this, but recruiting is something that the child needs to do him or herself. They need to go through that process. First of all, the skills that they gain by going through the process are invaluable in life. So they learn communication skills. They learn how to market and sell themselves. They learn how to create video, create social media that's appealing, um, how to interact with adults, you know, all of these things that are crucial to their maturity and their development into adult human beings. Yeah. Also though, your child needs to make that final decision about where he or she's going to play because if things don't work out, like they didn't work out for my son his freshman year, it's the kid who made that decision. They own that decision. And if you as the parent step in and say, you have to go to this school and the kid doesn't want to go there and things don't work out for the kid at that program, they come back to the parent and say, you made me go here. How could you make me do this? Exactly. You know? Whereas, I mean, for my son, when things didn't work out for him, that was a huge learning opportunity for him. He had mm -hmm. to figure out how to extricate himself from a bad situation that he had chosen for himself and figure out a way to make it work and, and move on. And he did. And he gained unbelievably invaluable skills from doing that. So oh, yeah. huge proponent of let the kid own it. Well, Lisa, thank you so much for that awesome insight. I really did enjoy talking to you today. It's really good hearing a voice where it can really help the value of parents with their kids. So I really appreciate having you on, Lisa. And if you guys want to check her out, I'm going to leave all the links to her Instagram, podcast, website, everything you can find that in the description below, wherever you're watching this. So Lisa, thank you again for joining me. I hope to see you real soon in person. Thanks, Philip. Stay safe and uh, good luck with all the stuff you're doing. Congratulations. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. All right. Take care. You too.